Here's a quick look at our very frosty cold yard on Christmas Eve, but everything is rimmed in frost because it is quite chilly today. And here is our outdoor Christmas tree with homemade fun Christmas ornaments that we did. This is just Sculpty Clay. We wandered around the yard and looked for dried things that we thought would be fun and did impressions of them and then painted them. This is from our juniper tree. This is actual holly. We do have a little holly. So Merry Christmas to everybody and all of your Christmas celebrations, whatever that looks like. Hey, homesteaders, gardeners, and cooks. My name is Jennifer. Welcome to Miles Away Farm. Thanks for joining me in my kitchen. Today, we are making a borscht. Um, borscht is a beet and cabbage soup, often made with beef or at least with beef broth, although you can definitely make it vegetarian. And I have a, um, a tentative relationship with beets. I'm not a super beet fan. If you want super strong beet flavor, you can take these beets, peel them with a potato peeler, and then shred them and put them into the soup raw, and that will give you really intense beet flavor. You can also roast them and peel them and then put them into the soup, or you can boil them and put them into the soup. If you boil them first to get them soft, that's gonna give you the least intense beet flavor, and that is the route that I'm gonna go. Because while I have a reasonable relationship with beets, I don't absolutely love them. The super earthy flavor of them is a bit of a challenge for me. And so I tend to go a little lighter rather than a little heavier on the flavor. These beets came out of my garden. I'll have to look at the video of when I last picked them, but I'm guessing late September, um, if not, uh, older than that. So beets store very well and that's part of why this soup exists because it comes out of the Ukraine part of the world and that area has long cold winters and these are really great root storage vegetables as is a lot of the other ingredients that are in here. So commonly is beets, onions, carrots, and cabbage. And all of those, this is a cabbage that I picked, um, I'm not sure when but it's definitely a couple of months old. And so all of those store well in a root cellar. And if you don't have a root cellar, they generally store well in a crisper or of a fridge. And so it helps if you don't have a root cellar to have an extra fridge, if you've got a garage to do that, or you just stash them in your crisper and keep an eye on them. So yeah, literally these beets have been in my crisper for, it is now Christmas Eve. And so these have been in storage for three months solid, easily. And the tops of them were getting kind of slimy, uh, and so I did have to cut the tops off. But other than that, they are perfectly fine and they're gonna be perfectly good to eat. So beach store for a really long time. I'm putting a bunch of different alliums in this just because I still have some leftover from the garden. And so I've got some green onions, I have a leek, and then I have standard yellow onions. So that's gonna go in here. I also have a shallot. And so I'm gonna throw that in there as well. I'm just kind of cleaning out the fridge. And then potatoes are common. Again, another good storage crop. So potatoes are gonna go into this, uh, a little bit of garlic, and then I have some beef broth. And let me know if you guys are interested in seeing a video on how to do beef broth or bone broth canned. There's a ton of videos out there, and so I haven't done it just because I feel like it's a fairly common thing and there's some good instructional videos on it. But if you wanna know how I do it, let me know in the comments and maybe I'll do a video on how to can beef broth because it's kind of a fun project and it's a good winter project. Uh, and then I also am gonna put in some tomatoes. There's usually some kind of tomato product in a borscht. Sometimes it's just tomato paste. I'm gonna use a quart can of canned tomatoes from the garden. Oh, and then of course carrots also from the garden and some celery from the garden. So this is a great homestead meal because pretty much everything in here can be sourced out of the garden and a lot of it is good long-term storage foods. So it's packed with vegetables, it's full of tons and tons of great nutrition and it's delicious. Um, the other thing that is always in borscht is some kind of vinegar. So it's a little bit of a sweet and sour soup and so we're gonna add some vinegar to this as well, probably red wine vinegar. And then because I happen to have like a half a chub of ground beef in my fridge. I am going to put some ground beef in this. You can find recipes from America's Test Kitchen or 
from Serious Eats that go through from the very beginning, um, either making this with beef or pork, where you essentially start by making the stock that goes into this. Um, but I have canned beef stock already, so I'm not going to fiddle around with that. And honestly, for a weeknight meal, you could do this with better than bouillon, beef bouillon, and it would be just fine. So don't get too hung up on, you know, it has to be this rarefied air beef stock in order for it to be good. It's still good. So we're just going to do a fairly simple, quick beef borscht. Uh, as a Christmas Eve dinner and it's going to be nutritious and delicious and super yummy. So let's get started. So I'm going to boil these. This is about a pound and a half of beets. And I'm not worried about these being super scrubbed because they're going to get peeled and rinsed again once they're cooked. And I am going to put a little bit of salt and a little bit of vinegar in this. Um, one of the recipes that I was looking at called for that in the water for the beets, and I think that's probably a good idea. I think the acid helps keep the beets from losing quite as much of their color. And then the salt, of course, just helps flavor. I have this apple scrap vinegar that I haven't used much of. Just gonna throw a couple tablespoons of that in here. This is kind of fun. I have a whole video on this of how I made this, and since I put it in the jar, it's about a year old, um, February of 2023, so not quite a year. Look at the mothers that have formed since it's just been sitting in the jar in my cupboard. So there's at least one, two, three good-sized ones. I see a fourth one in there, maybe a fifth one. So it's kind of continued to ferment, which is really fun. And I have those mothers for starting a new batch if I want to. I'm also just gonna throw in some salt. I'm just winging the amounts here. But we'll bring that to a boil and boil these until they're tender, fork tender, or putting a knife in them tender. And that's gonna take a while. This especially is a really big beat. And so um, I'm guessing that's gonna take a half hour, 45 minutes at least. And just for fun, I'll show you guys this. I had some extra beets in the fridge that I didn't need for this soup. And so I decided to roast them and make a little bit of a beet salad particularly because I really love beet salad with goat cheese and I happen to have some goat cheese in my fridge. And so these have been a little bit of oil and roasting. So this is the other way to do this. Um, these have been roasting for quite a while, actually about an hour and a half. Yeah, those are nicely done. And then once these cool, I will hand peel them and chop them and put them in a nice beet salad. So lots of different ways to cook beets. Um, I imagine you could also do them in an instant pot. I've never done that, but I imagine if you were in a hurry, that would also work. So yeah, shredding them raw, putting them in stuff, dicing them raw, putting them in stuff to cook, roasting them or boiling them. Lots of different ways to go. Whatever your comfort level is and your flavor level is on beets. talked about this in videos before, but in my mind, this is the proper way to cut up an onion. And so you leave the root end on, you cut it from pole to pole, so top to bottom. And then because this is still on here and I've sliced it, um, it's gonna hang on to those pieces for the most part, and it's gonna make it much easier to slice consistently. If you cut that end off, once you get about halfway through the onion, everything starts to slide. And it's really annoying and it's also really dangerous because it's very easy to cut your fingers if you've got pieces of onion that are sliding around on top of each other and then you get pieces that aren't even. Um, you'll see some people that will do what I just did and then they also cut it once this way. In my opinion, onions have layers going that direction already and it is completely unnecessary to do this cut. You do you, do what you feel comfortable with, but I think that's just silly and unnecessary. And I'm also not a chef looking for absolutely uniform pieces. I just did a half storage onion because I also have in here the shallot, the leeks, and the green onions. So I've got plenty of allium already. And then we're just gonna add this little bit to it. And then I've got the equivalent of 
one large carrot, give or take. These are garden, garden carrots, so a lot of variation on size. And this is garden celery. And you can tell that because I've got some damage. This is probably from slugs or pill bugs, but it's not gonna hurt anything. And so what I'll do, probably gonna do two of those. What I'll do here is just scrape off a little bit of that scarring. One of the hardest things about growing celery is that every little insect, including earwigs and pill bugs, like to get in between the stalks. And so it's actually really hard to grow without a lot of bug damage unless you're spraying the bejesus out of it. So I just live with the bug damage. And I got a nice little harvest from just uh, five or six plants this year. And I haven't done it yet, but my plan is to take the ones I still have in my walk-in that are holding, because celery holds really well. And uh, I'm gonna chop it and freeze it as a mirepoix with onions and carrots in like two cup total measuring cups. And then when I need that to start a soup, I've got it, which I could have done if with this if I'd had it ready because it's basically a mirepoix is what I'm putting together. Hi, Bodie. I'm not cutting anything for you, buddy. We're not doing doggy treats right now. Go back to bed, baby. Thank you. Go to bed. And I don't love big chunks of celery. I really dislike raw celery, period. And so you can cut this as fine as you like, but I generally do a pretty fine dice on my celery just because I don't love a big chunk of celery. The hardest part about this soup is all of the veg prep. It's super healthy and delicious, but it does take quite a bit of chopping. And they tell you, experts and you know people that have a lot more chef experience than I do, will tell you when you're chopping vegetables, one of the things that you should be doing, and I really struggle with this, but I'm trying to get better about it, is when you're holding things, you hold like this, so it's a claw, and then there's like you're you're going against the your knuckle um, or the front of your hand. You're not doing anything like this where you can get get something in the way and accidentally cut yourself. And so it's a really good way of holding onto the vegetables without worrying about cutting your fingers off. So good advice and something I am working on getting better about. All right, so there's our mirepoix prepped. Our beets are cooking and we'll be back in a little bit when we're ready to start putting some of this together. All right, our beets have been cooking for probably about an hour, maybe 45 minutes. Don't remember what I set the timer for originally. They are done and anything that, they, mostly I'm concerned with the outside being thoroughly done and being easy to peel because if the inside isn't quite done, they're gonna cook in the soup. And so it's not critical that the inside be completely soft. And I'm just gonna drain these and cool them. Similar to way you would if it was a hard boiled egg actually. It's interesting, now that they're boiled, you can actually see the color. I have three different kinds of beets that I was growing, including uh, Chiogo, which is the one that has the red target in the middle, and then a red beet and uh, a golden beet. And I didn't have very many golden beets. I think that's what this is. This might be Chiogo, I'm not sure. A Little bit of damage at the top there, but that'll come right off when we peel it. So we're just gonna get these peeled up and diced and ready to go in our soup. This part is so gratifying, like peeling a beet is super gratifying, don't know why. And if these were super fresh, this skin would just peel right off. Um, it might be a little more difficult to get off because they've been sitting for a long time and so they're a little bit drier. I did the, the ones that I baked earlier, some of those were, um, harder to peel than a really fresh beet would be, but certainly 100% usable. Mostly I wanna make sure I get this dried out top off of here.
What is you guys' favorite way to eat beets, or do you eat beets? I probably never ate a beet at all until my 30s. They were definitely a hard no for me for a very long time. Basically, I like them with other strong flavors, and so I really think the key for not if you don't love beets, is to figure out how to cook them with other really strong flavors. So nuts and garlic and um, mustard and onions, things that help carry and contrast with that really earthy flavor that they have. You can see how some of this is coming off pretty easy. Some of it's taken a little bit more time. That's what you expect to see. See how that just came right up? Like when they're really fresh, that's how they'll peel. You can just push it off with your fingers. These are not quite there. And some of you are probably asking the question, if you don't really love beets, why are you eating them? And they are a nutritional powerhouse. It's one of those things that always comes up on lists of superfoods. So really, really good for you in lots of different ways. And so I just keep trying to keep them in my diet. All right, we're ready to start cooking here. And I think I'll probably do a little olive oil, but I'm gonna use some ghee, which is clarified butter. I think cabbage and butter is just a wonderful flavor together. And so I'm gonna opt for that. And I have a video on how to make your own ghee. It's quite expensive to buy and it's really easy to make. And so if you're interested, basically a pound of butter will make a pint of ghee. You don't lose a whole lot. I'm gonna let this cook down for at least five minutes. Most of my veg is pretty small. And then I will start browning off the beef in this mixture. I'm getting just a tiny bit of browning on some of this because my pan was a little bit too hot and I don't really care. A little caramelization, it's not burned. I have no idea how traditional or untraditional that is but I'm not gonna worry about it. And in terms of beet, I basically just want bite-sized pieces on my spoon. You can be as fiddly or not fiddly about this as you like. Look how pretty that is where half the reason I keep coming back to these is just because they're so beautiful. So this is the Chayoga, which is the one, it loses a lot of its striping when it cooks, but let's see if we can see it here, yeah. So when this is raw, that red and white stripe is really obvious, it's really pretty. And for whatever reason, I don't know why, Chayogas always grow very, very well for me here, better than red beets. And then golden beets are really hard to grow for some reason in this climate. And so I always grow all three, but my Chayoga, these Chayoga seeds are quite old. I haven't actually bought them in a couple of years and yet I always end up with good germination and a bunch of those in my beet mix. I also have a video on pickled beets, which has been quite popular if you guys are ever interested in pickled beets. I love a good spicy pickled beet. I don't like them just plain but um, you throw in some onions and some baking spices and I think they're just delightful on a salad. All right, this sounds done. It took me years to learn to actually cook not just with my eyes, but with my nose and with my ears. You can definitely hear a change in something like this as the water cooks off and the, the sound that it's making starts sounding more like it's frying and less like it's boiling. All right, this is our 
leftover ground beef. These ground beef chubs are a pound and a half instead of a pound, and so we often don't finish one if we're just making a quick batch of hamburgers or something. Look, it's the internet darling. This thing, this funny little meat masher, like everybody loves this. I bought one because I saw a bunch of other people who had it and loved it. So it's definitely um, very trendy, but it does work. It's great and it doesn't cost very much. So yeah, it was a good buy and it does help with chunking stuff up so that you don't get big pieces. All right, I'm just gonna let that start to saute and I'm trying to get a little bit of browning on this beef because that's gonna really up the flavor in my finished soup. Almost forgot, I did wanna put a little bit of garlic in there. And you don't add the garlic at the beginning of the cook because it tends to burn. And so generally you add it, you know, 30 seconds to a minute before you add a lot of liquid or when you've got enough volume, this beef is gonna be enough of a mitigating volume that it's not gonna cause this to burn, but I didn't wanna add it with the onions and the carrots. And I am gonna put a potato in my borscht. You see some recipes with it and some recipes without it. I like the fact that it thickens up the broth and just makes it feel like a more substantial meal and not just kind of leafy green vegetables. You can do as you like. This is a russet variety of potato that I grew this year. I can't remember, maybe Elba. I'll put the name up on the screen. And so this has been in storage since September and starting to get a little bit of sprouting. I am gonna be doing a video probably in January that's all about what do you do with your potatoes when you get to this point where you've grown them, they've been in storage, they're starting to sprout and you don't wanna lose them all. Um, can you freeze them? Can you can them? And if so, how should you do those things? And I'm gonna do a whole video on all of that because we did some really good successful things last year that for the first time that I really, really liked. And uh, I have very strong opinions on canning potatoes. I like them, but I like them done the way the tested recipes are done and not the way a lot of YouTubers are doing it right now, which is without any water. And I think that is, it's only a matter of time until somebody gets sick from that. And I'm just gonna, again, dice these up into bite-sized pieces. And potatoes will slowly brown if they're sitting out in the air, which is why I waited until now to do this. You can store them in water and that will help if you wanna do this ahead of time, but they'll just discolor from exposure to the air if you leave them sit out after they're peeled. Kind of like sweet potatoes, those do the same thing. I'm gonna do one more potato. Let, let's check on our beef. See how that just makes short work of those big chunks? So great. All right, our meat is definitely cooked, but it's not very brown. I'm gonna give this just another couple minutes and see if I can get just a little bit of color on some of that. See a little bit of that stuff sticking on the bottom. That's actually a good thing. That is flavor. It's not burned. It's just starting to really caramelize, I'm getting some good sugars. And this isn't traditional, but I'm gonna add a little bit of flour to this and cook it off as if it were, you know, a thickened soup. My mother-in-law just included this as a Christmas gift. It's a little bit of a can of jar opener, kind of fun. Seems to work quite well. And this is our beef broth. And hopefully you guys can see this. It's fairly gelatinous. And that's what you want in a good beef broth. Yeah, see how that's like jello? It's a good indication that I did a pretty good job when I made that. 
And I'm unsure just yet if I want to use both of these jars or just one. So at this point, I'm stirring and I'm kind of deglazing the bottom of that pan. So that additional liquid is going to make everything that was cooked on down there loosen up and go back into the broth. And that is going to be delicious flavor. Quite beefy. And then I'm going to add in our potatoes because they're going to take a little while to cook. Bring this up to a boil. And I'm also going to add in our tomatoes. And we'll see where we're at volume wise. These are homegrown heirloom canned tomatoes. You can see I've got different colors in there. That's a pretty good indication that they were a bunch of different heirloom varieties. And those will break down um, once they start heating up. I'm not worried about them being a little bit chunky. And then there's some herbs that we want to put in here. Thyme and bay leaf are pretty common and some parsley. And the beef broth had some salt. The tomatoes have some salt. And that bite I tasted tasted fairly good salt wise. I don't think we need to add any more salt just yet. And of course I had a good pinch in there with the veg. The other thing that's very common in borscht is caraway, but I'm going to leave that out just because I personally am not really a caraway person. All the different things that have a bit of an anise flavor, whether it's fennel or caraway or Thai basil or tarragon, I'm just not a big licorice note girl. And I'm not measuring this, I'm just kind of eyeballing it here, but a little bit of time some fresh parsley. Put caraway in if you love it. If I do use caraway in things, I tend to grind it, which is not what people usually do. Um, I do better when it's spread out and it isn't like a big seed of caraway for me to find, which I definitely don't love. All right, we're gonna bring this back to a simmer and simmer it until those potatoes are tender. And I don't think we need any more liquid there. I think this is gonna be more like a stew um, and we've still got to add the beets and the cabbage. So I think we're looking pretty good. We're just going to leave that. This will take about a half an hour for those potatoes to get softened up. All right, it has been a couple of hours. Cooked this and then turned it off because it was a little too early for dinner. And so far this is delicious. I'm going to add our beets and then I'm going to add about a half of a small head of cabbage. I'm glad I didn't put that other quart of beef stock in here. It would have been too much. And this is a different head of cabbage than the one I showed you during the introduction because I was out in my spare fridge replenishing my stock of carrots that were in the house and I realized I still had this cabbage out there and this is actually from late June or early July. And so this has been in storage, in the cold storage for, well, do the math, almost six months. Um, again, cabbage is a root cellar crop. It's the, one of the reasons why it was so popular and is so popular in cold regions of the world because it stores. And so you grow it during the growing season and then you have it for a lot of the rest of the year. Of course, they also made sauerkraut and fermented cabbage and that kind of thing. So, um, but I mean, pretty good. The color has faded a little bit. It's not as bright green as it was, but other than that, absolutely nothing wrong with it. I'm just gonna chunk this up in a little bit more chunky fashion than shreds. I don't want shredded cabbage. I'm just making that judgment call as we go here. Quite lovely. And I actually still have six or seven cabbage from the fall in storage as well. So I'm gonna have to get to making some good cabbage stuff. So this is also gonna go into our soup.
And really we just wanna cook the beets through to warm them up and the cabbage through, so five or 10 minutes. Um, cabbage is one of those vegetables that you either wanna barely cook it or you wanna cook the bejesus out of it. The in-between stage uh, is when it gets really smelly and kind of nasty. So better to lightly cook it or heavily cook it. We're gonna get this back up to a full boil, heat it through, add a little vinegar, and we're gonna be ready to serve. This is ready to serve, except for the vinegar. It definitely needs some brightening up to help cut through all that rich, beefy flavor. Bay leaf is just volunteering to come out. All right, I'm gonna add in a tablespoon of red wine vinegar, and then I'm gonna give this a taste. Maybe just a little bit more. This is also a very large pot of food. Don't yell at me for double dipping on the spoon. There's only two people in this house. Mm. Better. And I've mentioned this many times in videos, but um, the great cookbook, Salt, Fat, Acid, Heat. That's essentially what I'm running through in my head here. I'm tasting this and saying, does it is it salty enough? Is it fatty and unctuous enough? Does it have enough acid? And part of me really wants to put like a smoked paprika in this or some red pepper flakes, but I'm trying to stay towards the traditional recipe and not go way off the beaten path here. And then traditionally, the other thing that this often gets served with is a nice dollop of sour cream. Beautiful. And there you go. Borscht almost entirely from the farm. Absolutely delicious. Thanks for watching, Tribe. If you like this kind of content, give me a thumbs up, subscribe, leave me a comment and share. I have new content coming out every week.